A very warm welcome to you to this service of Evensong at Exeter Cathedral. You can download the order of service from the cathedral's website and follow along with us. Here begins the first verse of the 19th chapter of the first book of Kings. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also 
if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. He got up and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. He left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Get up and eat. He looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him and said, Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank. Then he went in the strength of that food for forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the Mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also you shall anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. And you shall anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat of Abel Maloa, as prophet in your place. Here ends the first lesson.
Here begins the 16th verse of the first chapter of the second letter of Peter. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we have been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honour and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory saying, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Here ends the second lesson.
Today's anthem is a setting of the words of Psalm 63 by Henry Purcell.
May I speak in the name of the living God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Many people will be far more familiar with the accounts of the wonderful story of Jesus' transfiguration from the Gospels, rather than the much briefer reference to it, which Peter makes in his epistle, which we have just heard. In fact, the author of the second letter of Peter is what we might call extremely sparing in what he writes. There's actually nothing said about what was actually seen when they ascended the mountain together. Nothing about Jesus' shining face, his brilliant dazzling clothing, the vision of Moses and Elijah standing with Jesus, the overshadowing cloud, none of them are mentioned. Instead, the only focus is on what was heard. This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Peter mentions simply the sound of God rather than the brilliant splendor of the sight of Jesus' transfiguration. Why so? Well, we don't know for certain. However, in the first decades after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, the retelling of Jesus' transfiguration amongst early Christian communities would have been so frequent that Peter may not have seen any reason to repeat what would have probably been well known. The second letter of Peter's main purpose was to give encouragement to early believers who may be losing hope in the resurrection and who'd begun to doubt that Christ would ever return. So our first reading then was concerned with a loss of hope and in fact abject despair and God's response to it. The book of Kings from which our first reading was taken was written hundreds of years before Peter's letter. It's an historical account of the two kingdoms of Judah and Israel as told from a specific perspective within Judaism. Elijah, as we heard, the great prophet, in fear of his life from King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, flees, eventually ending up hiding in a cave in Mount Herob, the mountain of God. Elijah has been faithful to God, confronting those who practiced idolatry. But of course, as we know, his zealousness led him to do things that God would never have wanted to, do, to have been done in his name. Even so, God refused to accept Elijah's despair at his predicament. What Elijah had, in effect, brought on himself. Hiding in a cave, Elijah listens out for God. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. God's presence was not at all where Elijah expected to be, but in the sound of sheer silence. We may be able to relate just a little to Elijah's despair, his sense of exhaustion, even self-pity. And there probably have been times in our lives when we may have committed everything to what we believed was right, only to find out that things didn't turn out as planned. We might just want to give up, want to go and hide. Our capacity to recognize in others their emotions and respond to them is one of the most essential qualities of what it means to be human. It's a wonderful gift, but it comes with a risk. It may seem like hair splitting, but relating to a particular feeling or experience and then identifying more fully, more completely with someone's circumstances 
aren't the same. The distance between sympathy and empathy may be far greater than we might think. And this is because our, our identity is uniquely ours. It's complex, it's made up of a lot of different factors and layers. It's shaped by our genes, our environment, our family, our future hopes, past experiences. All of these things blend together. There are different dimensions to it, our race, ethnicity, our nationality. Our identity can affect how we may fit in or not. And fundamentally as Christians, our identity is about who we are in relation to God and then in relation to one another and ultimately how our identities are transformed through allowing ourselves to receive God's love. St. Paul writes in his letter to the Galatians, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Now my guess is it's unlikely to have escaped your notice that these questions of identity and relationships or actually, more specifically, only some particular aspects of them, is occupying the church a great deal just at the moment, and is likely to do for some time to come. Our spending time in these conversations exploring these questions is something that's welcomed by some, less so by others. These conversations may bring with them a sense of hope, of new possibilities, of openness and change, but to others they may feel awkward, challenging, and simply not the main priority. And of course, this issue is far from the only one which is affecting the church today. Some may, even may think there's a risk of over-focusing on it to the detriment of other things which concern us all as Christians and as citizens. For example, there are concerns about the timing of these conversations and there's certainly some questioning of their relevance to our wider mission. These are big questions to consider and the church is taking a risk in opening out the conversation. Given just how much these issues connect so deeply and so personally with all our lives, our essential expression of our Christian identity, it's entirely possible that at the end of this period of national purposeful reflection, we may not arrive at a neat outcome. And in the end, we may well ask, where is God in all of this? Well, perhaps we can learn something from Elijah's experience. If we let the noise and the heat pass by, then through our conversations and reflections, we may be able to hear God speaking to us out of the sound of his silence and be guided to a different place in our lives together. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Thinking of today, St. Valentine's Day, and thinking too of our conversations of living in love and faith. We thank God for all kinds of human love, which are sincere, generous, and faithful. Lord, we praise you for life and for love, for hope and for joy, for giving and for sharing. We praise you for the way you have demonstrated your own great love, mercy and care 
in and through Jesus Christ our Lord. We ask you to bless us with your Holy Spirit and fill our lives and our relationships with your unfailing love and care. And we ask you to enable us so to live, love and share that our lives may be filled with the strength of your grace. Asking this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray for ourselves and the concerns that trouble our own hearts and minds and lives. For all that we know we must face in the coming weeks and months. For wisdom to know what to say and what to do. For strength to stand firm and for faith to trust the one who alone is trustworthy. May Christ hold us gently in his hands. Amen. Lord, on this Sunday before Lent, we have come to meet with you, to give you thanks and praise. In your grace, receive our poor offering and by your Holy Spirit, transform it into a celebration of your glory. As your disciples climbed the mountain of transfiguration, we ask you to give us a glimpse of that glory. We thank you for all those leading our worship today. And may all that has been said and sung lead us together to the throne of your grace. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Just before we close, I'd like to draw your attention to the cathedral website where our services for the coming weeks will be listed and in particular to mention that there will be a service online for Ash Wednesday this week, so please do join us in viewing that. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and if his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>